Okay, very happy to have uh, Jerry Kirkuso from the uh, University of uh, Georgia to give us a talk. And it was a DP variant in the whole of the particularly. So thank you very much for the invitation to speak at the seminar. So my goal today is to talk about a story which is a relation between uh, two topics, which both have to do with enumerative geometry, which both have to do with counting uh, geometric objects. The first topic is Donaldson Thomas invariance, or DT invariance for short, that I will always consider for non-compact Calabria three forms. So what are they? They are numbers, which are counts of either stable current sheaves, so if you want all morphic vector bundles or current sheaves, or more generally complexes of current sheaves, on some non-compact Calabio threefold X, or there is a mirror version in which these numbers are supposed to be count of special Lagrangians, some manifold of some mirror Calabio threefold Y. Okay, so here the data, the geometric initial data, is a Calabio threefold that for some reason would be assumed to be non compact. And once you have these non compact Calabio threefold, you can either look at current sheaves or special Lagrangian inside it and try to make sense of counts of such objects. And the second topic involves counting holomorphic curves inside a hyperkeller manifold that I will always denote by M. And the thing which is important for the general story is that the M can be of possibly I dimension. It's not, it's not of dimension two, or it's not small dimension in general. It will be in some example, but not in, in general. Okay, so in the first topic, we're counting things like vector bundles or Lagrangian like manifold. Right in the second topic, we are counting uh, all morphic curves. And the two settings are different. In the first, uh, first one, the setting is a Calabio threefold. In the second, the setting is some um, hypercalibre manifold. So if I claim that it should be a relation between these two topics, I should explain what is the relation between the Calabio threefold and the hypercalibre manifold, the M. And one way to uh, the relation between them is uh, through uh, physics. If I start with the Calabio threefold X, I can use it to compactify the 10 dimensional string theory on it to get a four dimensional field theory with n equal to uh, supersymmetry. And then the relevant hyperkeller geometry M will be the so called Coulomb branch of this theory on S1 times R3. So once you compactified one of the four dimensions through a circle, in other words, it is a so-called cyber witten uh, integrable system attached to this four-dimensional uh, theory. Sorry, before you go on. So yes. In your, in your physics relation, is only X cos R4 appear? Is a Y cos R4 also? So because X, if X and Y are mirror, if you do sheaves on one or special Lagrangian on the other, you get the same, the same answer. So you can, so yeah, so, if you flip X and Y at the same time you flip 2A and 2B, then you get the same thing. Okay. But it's true that for each Calabio, you have, you have two possibilities to, to do something. Okay, so this thing is just a very brief overview. I need to say uh, much more to make sense of it. So the first third of the talk, I will talk about some, uh, what I just said, but in much more details, what is a general uh, expected picture. And then the, the part of the talk will be a concrete example where uh, the Calabio threefold will be a very uh, concrete one known as local P2. I will take X to be KP2, so the total space of the canonical line bundle on the projective planes, on the complex projective planes. So equivalently, the total space of the line bundle O minus 3 over P2. So it's a non-compact Calabio threefold. It is the total space of a line bundle over a surface, the projective plane. And so inside it, you have a you have a compact surface, which is a projective plane. And you have a non-compact direction coming from from the line bundle. 
And for, we see uh, low, we see non-compact Calabria threefold. We consider Jonathan Thomas invariance counting current shifts. On the other side, we'll consider holomorphic curves in some uh, hyperkeller uh, geometry M. And in this example, this hyperkeller geometry M has complex dimension two, real dimension four, and uh, the hyperkeller manifold has many different uh, complex structures. And for different complex structures, the kind of concrete description of the space can be different. So in one uh, co complex structure I, this geometry will be an example of uh, elliptic fabrication over the complex line. It will just be a family of elliptic curve over C with a few uh, singular fibers. And in a different uh, complex structure that I call J, uh, this uh, surface can be realized as a complement of a smooth elliptic curve E inside the projective plane. So here what I denote by E is a smooth cubic plane curve in the plane, it's just a genus one curve. And because it's a cubic and the anti-canonical divisor of P2 is of degree three, the complement of a cubic is a calabio, it's a non-compact holomorphic uh, symplectic uh, surface. Okay, so it will be our basic uh, geometry. And uh, in some uh, more metric language, in some apicular metric language, it's an example of ALH uh, star metric. And actually, there have been recent work by Colin Stacomlin to show that indeed these two complex manifolds that indeed appear in the twister family of, uh, of this kind of, of matrix. So, but this is related to the mirror of. Yeah, that's right. And here I would explain at some point that actually this M is closely related to the mirror of X. But in the way I want to present it as fitting into the general expectation, I don't want to, to insist on that, but I will mention that at some point. And, uh, and ALH is a uh, fabrication? Yeah, that's right. I say it's elliptic fabrication. So yeah, it's T2, fab T2 fabrication. Well, we'll Yes, yeah, so yeah, so it's some um, elliptic fabrication. So it has some number of uh, uh, singular fibers. Actually, this is one with uh, three nodal singular fibers, but it's fabrication over a line. So there is also a singularity at infinity somehow, which is not included in the space, but which would be included if you compactify to over P1. And at infinity, you get a cycle of nine P1s. Yeah, but the ALH has to do with the classification of like complete uh, hypercalar uh, metric. And uh, I don't know if it's so relevant, but thing like maybe ALF, it looks like a uh, thing which matter for 3D mirror symmetry. Thing like LG, they are like uh, each in system, like elliptic fabrication, which happens to be each in system, so LG. And this thing looks like each in system because it looks like elliptic fabrication. But somehow it's not. It's called ALH. So from a metric point of view, it is also a modular space of doubly periodic uh, magnetic monopole. OK, so I will talk about this uh, concrete example. And at the end, I will talk about some heuristic or physics derivation of the general correspondence and mention the relation with so called holomorphic flow theory of this uh, hyperkeller manifold. Okay, so it's a plan. So I will start by a kind of general introduction with a bit more uh, details. So I say on the first topic, I have the geometry of DT invariance. So for me, DT invariance will be noted by omega, gamma, or phi, and they will be integers. And the accounts of uh, geometric objects on the Calabria threefold X with given topology class gamma satisfying the appropriate notion of uh, stability uh, condition. Okay, so if you consider current sheaves, you can consider stable or morphic vector bundle or stable current sheaves or more generally stable objects in the mirror of category of a given chunk character gamma, where the stability is defined by the Keller parameter uh, U. 
how the mirror version of this story will be to consider special Lagrangian sum manifolds for given homology class gamma, where the stability is encoded in the notion of special Lagrangian with respect to a specific holomorphic volume form, so for a specific complex parameter uh, U. Here is a physics translation. In from a physics point of view, if you have some four-dimensional field theory, which is n equal to the symmetric, any height will be because what I will really consider later will really be maybe 4D cross circle. Here, what I really care about is the fact that there is 4D non-compact direction at low energy, it looks 4D with n equal to supersymmetry. And when I there is such a physical theory attached to it. There are various uh, geometries. One of them denoted by B is the Coulomb branch of Vakra, of this four dimensional theory, which in most examples is a R dimensional complex manifold, which is often just isomorphic to R dimensional complex vector space, CR. So the space of Vakra of your theory in four dimensions. And so if you have a generic point U in this space of Vakra, the low energy theory is the abelian gauge theory. So we do some abelian gauge group, U1 to the R, where R is some integer called the rank, which is also the complex dimension of this four dimensional Coulomb branch. And then uh, by a supersymmetry, you have some BPS bound for objects of given charge gamma in uh, the vacuum U, so which is determined by a complex number called the sum of charge, Z gamma of U. The BPS bound says that the mass of an object of charge, of charge gamma is bounded below by the absolute value of the, the complex number. And then what you can do is to consider the space of BPS states, which are the states that is saturating this BPS bound, and you get a vector space that I denote by H gamma of U, which typically will be finitely uh, dimensional, okay, rather than enjoy the space of states in the quantum field theory, it's an infinite dimensional thing, but if you restrict with these extremal or BPS the sector, you get a finite dimensional vector space H gamma of U, so which depend on U in which vacua you are and on the charge gamma. And then you can extract a number out of this space, roughly taking the dimension of this vector space or a sine version of this uh, dimension. So can you see what the F is? Yeah, usually F is some kind of like fermionic uh, Number so maybe your vector space is like Zen mode two graded and F is a Zen mode two uh, graded. Okay, so so here this slide is supposed to be the translation between the geometric language and the physics language. So if I have start with my Calabrian threefold X, I can consider type two or type two B string theory on X and get some kind of four dimensional uh, theory. And now the expectation is that uh, the universal cover of B minus delta, so B was the Coulomb branch of the four dimensional theory. And I said uh, at the generic point, you have some abelian gauge theory, but you have some non generic locus that I call delta, so you can have discriminant locus of complex dimension one, where this thing will not be true. And if I remove this locus and take the corresponding universal cover, the expectation that this universal cover as a natural maps to the space of notion of stability for the geometric objects that you want to count on your Calabria. Okay, so if you want to count current sheaves, you really want to look at the Dirac category of current sheaves. If you look at special Lagrangians, you really want to look at the Fukaya category of your Calabria threefold. And then you really want to consider stability in the sense of bridge lines. So you want to look at spaces of bridge lines stability conditions. And the general expectation is that the 4D Coulomb branch up to taking some universal cover as a natural map to this space of stability conditions. And then if it is okay, then it makes sense to have a dictionary, then the expectation is that the DT invariant corresponding to the stability U should be equal to the count of BPS states for the vacuum U. Well, Correspondent uh, between Barry, the two can, you explain, can, you, can you explain why this uh, bridge stability conditions is supposed to map to or from the Coulomb branch? Yeah, so this thing is supposed 
Uh, this map is supposed to go from the universal cover of the Coulomb branch minus discriminant locus to the to the space of bridge on stability conditions. Um, uh, why? Ah, why it should be true? Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's a, essentially the original motivation for Bridgeron to introduce the notion of stability. So somehow stabi uh, stability in the sense of Bridgeron come from trying to axiomatize the properties that BPS objects should have. So, so this is the very and, statement, right? The coulomb branch here is just a module on the bottom, yeah. But it's nothing stability that doesn't know. Ah, yeah, that's right. This is what's not. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, definitely. Yeah, if, if I do the Fukaya side of the story, it is a map that that uh, you know it should be the map from the complex structures of your Calabria to the space of uh, ah. stability conditions of the Fukaya category. Okay. Where the center charge should be given by integrating the holomorphic volume form. Yeah. So actually, on this symplectic side, what the map should be at least at the level of center charge, if not really mysterious. Even if actually proving that what you get is a bridge on safety condition is not known in general. Whereas on the on the other side, it's less obvious to say what what the map should be. I mean geometrically. Yeah, I said it actually it's not a question to prove it, it's a bridge of stability condition. It's a question, the question is rather to show that bridge of definition is the right one. I think there's no question that the physics definition is the right thing to want, but what 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 actually minimal side of work goes with it? Yeah, that's right. the problem is that the and the physics definition is not really a complete definition. Like, definitely it defines what the central charge should be, mm -hmm. but for example, it does not tell us enough to which in bridge language will be the art of the DRF category, like which piece exactly you should look your stable object. I guess it's not, I don't know a physics recipe to, to, to identify that, for example. I can't categorize with special grounding, obviously. You might want to know how the special grounding is better in the category and what the category. But, but here, you don't need much of the Dirac category. You don't need a special grounding to think of a business structure. Yeah, yeah, that, that's. But yeah, so the, yeah, the kind of related question is that in, in which sense are the geometric special Lagrangians really the correct objects from the physics point of view, for example, which is maybe not so fully clear in complete generality. Oh, so true. then, literally, from a physics point of view, you say you want special Lagrangians, but then the, all the kind of technical difficulties which appear is if your Lagrangian becomes singular, what do you do? If you want to consider moduli space of such objects to extract the space of VPS states, there are like some more geometric questions to. Well, to yeah, the, yeah, that's right, which is related to yeah, the question yeah. how do you count? Yeah, that's right. So, so, so this is just some version of this question. So, okay. And as I said, from in this talk, I will only consider a non compact Calabrio threefold, which in the physics language is related to the fact that I don't want uh, dynamical gravity in my four dimensional theory. Okay. At some point, I will might say something about why. So, here is another piece of uh, a general expectation. So, you have these DT invariants or BPS numbers, omega, gamma of u. So we depend on this discrete parameter gamma and this continuous parameter u. And there are a constant function of u away from some real co-dimension one loci in B called walls, across which uh, these integers can jump and discontinuously. And that jump is supposed to be controlled by a universal wall crossing formula written down by a conservative summerman. Here is some, uh, just a picture of what happens for a concrete example of physical theory, the simplest n equal to four dimensional SU2 gauge theory, one of the original examples of Sabine and Wittens, where B is a complex plane. 
delta consists of uh, two points. And then uh, in the red, here and here, I have two rows which separate uh, my complex plane into two chambers. And you can show that in the interior uh, chamber, the set of BPS states is relatively simple. There's a finite BPS spectrum, meaning there are finitely many classes gamma, for which is numbers are uh, non zero. Whereas outside, there is an infinite BPS spectrum. There are infinite many gamma for which it integers are uh, uh, non zero. And this thing is a very really, uh, special picture where the picture of walls is extremely simple. In general, in the example we'll consider later, the structure of walls and chambers will be much more uh, complicated. Here there is only two chambers. In, gen in general, there will be infinite many uh, chambers and the resulting picture will be uh, complicated. Here are a few more words about the Apekela side of the story. So in the physics language, it is the corresponding cyber Witten integral system. So M will be the Coulomb branch of the four dimensional series compactly defined on the circle. It is the hyperkeller manifold of complex dimension 2R. So R was a complex dimension of B. So M is twice the dimension of P. And it is M as a natural structure of complex integral system. So there's a map pi from M to B, such that uh, the general fiber uh, let me say an appropriate complex structure, abelian varieties, compact uh, tori. Okay, so the property of this apicular geometry, so now it's physics definition, it's apicular geometry, which captures the low energy physics or your four dimensional theory compact around a circle. It's the limit, you get the three dimensional theory, which is a sigma model with target is uh, apicular manifold. Okay, so it's hyperkeller, it has a twister sphere of compatible complex structure. So you have IJK, which satisfies a um, quaternionic relation. And this map pi from M to B is holomorphic in a particular complex structure, which is a complex structure I denote by I. So it's holomorphic, in this case, the fibers are uh, holomorphic some manifold of M, and they are actually uh, abelian varieties of complex emotion R. But if I take a different complex structure, for example, if I take the complex structure J theta, which is a linear combination cosine theta J plus sine theta K, so a linear combination of the two orthogonal uh, complex structures, then the fibers of this map will be special aggressions with respect to the corresponding Keller form and uh, holomorphic volume form. Okay, so depending on which complex structure you look uh, at this map, it looks different. And uh, finally, here, okay, so the expectation as recorded as a base, so the B, which now is a base of this integral system, should have a map to some base of Brillouin safety condition. So there should be a corresponding source of charge yeah, so the physics of the charge. And the general uh, expectation is that some of the space of charges, here I should be able to describe it as a relative second homotopy of M relatively to fiber P inverse of U. Okay, so if I fix a point U, if I want to describe the lattice of charges corresponding to this point U, I should be able to describe it in terms of classes of a disk in M with boundary on the corresponding fiber over U. And this thing has a natural map to the H1 of the fiber in which the natural electric and magnetic charges of the U1 to the R are living. And then the central charge will just be obtained by integrating omega I, which is a I holomorphic symplectic form over a class a gamma. Okay, so uh, as part of this hypercalar data, there is omega i, which is some holomorphic symplectic form for the pi complex structure. And uh, essentially, if you have a disk with boundary on one of the fiber, because the fibers are i holomorphic, omega i restricted this fiber as zero. So it's exactly the condition for this integral to make sense. In general, if I integrate uh, 
a closed form, I want to integrate over a closed cycle to get something uh, topological. Here, I integrate over something which has some boundary, but over the boundary, this thing is zero, so it actually makes sense. Something like that. natural thing. Okay, so here is just a picture of uh, this kind of uh, geometry. So if M is a, uh, when the case where M is complex dimension two, real dimension four, if R is equal to one, B just a complex plane, delta will be a bunch of points in this complex plane, and M will be a family of genus one curves, a family of LP curves, We might become singular over the points in the discriminant locus. And a large class of such examples of such geometry are given by a each in system or in space of fixed bundles, which are related to what in physics are called class S uh, series. And so if you want to have a large class of such geometries, you just take modus space of fixed bundles. And in this talk, we'll take a consider geometry, which is not among the fixed bundles family, but which looks uh, very much uh, like that. Uh, Peruk? Yes. Uh, for the Higgs bundles, um, this omega i is an exact symplectic form. Does that fact have an interpretation in the physics, or um, is it an accident? I think this is, uh, okay, let me see, omega i equal omega j. Yeah. Just so is it always exact? I mean, definitely it is exact if there is no puncture. These are the compact uh, surface. Oh, yeah, I, don't, I, 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 I think always because I, I mean, I think it's the one that comes from just uh, the Higgs bundles being T star bungee or whatever. Uh, okay, let, let me see yeah, if it's the correct one, actually. Yeah, that's right. I think, yeah, exactly. So, Maybe I will say something wrong, but in my mind, it has to do with the fact that there is a sister action on the moduli space of uh, X bundle. Yeah, for sure, yeah. And then in my mind, the two are, are related somehow, like some other, the one form will be related to the sister action. Yeah, it, it, it's almost the same fact, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and yeah, so definitely if you take surface with punctures, maybe you can lose the sister action. And, and then maybe this fact might not be. Uh -huh. I know, I guess, like in physics language, it's sister action as, would I say something wrong? I think it has to do with the fact that you can get sometimes some conformal four dimensional series. Ah, uh, okay. And, uh, yeah, so I think it is one possible physics translation of this condition. But yeah, I will not assume that in. in, in yeah, in fact, and I'm pretty, yeah, let me see. Yeah, I'm pretty sure in the example I will consider probably my omega i will not be exact. Oh. Yeah, that's right. So the fact that it's exact means in particular there should be a zero period of a closed two cycles. Yeah, absolutely. Now, now I'm not sure which one you call omega i and which one omega j. Maybe omega i is omega i is the one for which the fibers are Lagrangian. Okay. Yeah, that's also says capital omega i. If I restrict it to the fibers, I get zero. Uh, in, in, in the Hitchin system, is that the one that's uh, uh, scaled by the C star action? No, I, I will get confused. I prefer not, okay, to, okay. <laughs> not to, to, to. But yeah, definitely it's made of small omega j, small omega k. And definitely small omega k is like the real symplectic structure coming from T star and G. Ah, uh, okay, okay, I see. Okay, so here yeah, I gave some very rough picture of the two sides. So the ET side and the Pekela side, and now the rough uh, expectation 
is that uh, if you fix a point u in the base of this picture, then you can do two things. On one side, you can consider the GT invariant, count of BPS set in physics language, counting stable objects where the stability is defined by the point u of class gamma, which is what I introduced before. Omega gamma of u is either your count of current sheaves or your count of special Lagrangians. My u is telling you what is a Keller modulus for current sheaves or what is a complex modulus for special Lagrangians. And the gamma is a kind of charge of this object. And on the other side, I have something I denoted n gamma of u, which is supposed to be a count of holomorphic curve inside the, the hyperkeller uh, geometry uh, M. Except now because it's uh, hyperkeller, there are many complex structures, so I need to be careful what do I mean by uh, holomorphic. And I want to consider J theta holomorphic curves where theta was this cosine theta J plus sine theta K, this particular a linear combination of the complex structures. So it is for this complex structure that the fibers are special Lagrangians. So it makes sense to count uh, corresponding holomorphic disk with boundary on them. So n gamma of u is supposed to be some kind of count of j theta holomorphic curve. Maybe in the first version I would like to make, let me say disk. Okay. I would tend to say yes, but maybe it needs to be checked. <laughs> okay. What was the question? If these numbers is related to obstructions of the Lagrangian into the corresponding superpotential. Uh, um, I mean, so, so, so definitely this disk has like in some simplistic language like mass of index zero D. So definitely they contribute to the obstruction of this Lagrangian as object in the Fukaya category, which is what the... I, I'm a little skeptical because in the Fukaya category, you're free to perturb the perturb J. And if you're free to perturb J, then all accounts vanish. That is that's the, correct. The, 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 these are some kind of special counts. Yes, I, yeah, that's fine. So yeah, I guess what Vivek is saying is that if you do the honest potential, maybe it's always zero anyway, because the oh, answer well, should what be. Counts that we have. What, what does it mean to have? The, like to fix the, the you can't polymorphic this for a fixed complex structure and you are not allowed to perturb it. Like from just general Fukaya or a model point of view, you can pick any complex structure compatible with your simplistic form. And this is kind of upper color setting, this count would be zero because generically there would be no such uh, curves, no such uh, holomorphic curves. Yeah, so a very much related fact is that the theta that you need to pick needs to be finely tuned. This theta needs to be tuned to be the phase of this complex number z gamma of u, where z gamma of u was a c is an integral. Okay, essentially, you can check that this thing is a necessary condition to have a non trivial uh, moduli space. For a generic uh, theta, there will be no holomorphic curve with boundary on these fibers. But if you fix your class gamma, so gamma. In C, on C side, it's a kind of homology class of your disk. If you fix the homology class, and if you tune theta to be the phase of the corresponding uh, integral of omega i, the corresponding sort of charge, then there is a chance for the existence of such a disk. And somehow you should try to be able, you should try to extract a number out of it. Maybe I can stop here. If there are more questions about his kind of general 
function. So yeah, there is two sides. There is gamma on both sides, u on both sides. So and some of gamma and u, there's different flow on both sides. So, is a, so on one side, for example, on the right, u is with the five is some fiber of the torus vibration. And this fiber is telling us what, where is the boundary of the disk we are counting. But on the other side, the U only matters to the, just the point in the base, telling me what is the stability, what is the, as a complex or Keller modulus of my Calabria three form. And then what is the correct notion of stability to define ET invariance? And then yeah, that's also this n gamma of u to, de to define it, you should count j theta on a morphic curve where theta is this specific value, oh, like the phase. Yeah, that's right. if you move theta away, j theta on a morphic curve will disappear actually. So it's very important that uh, you pick this particular phase. So, so the circle is the 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 cool right now, right? Is as you said, it's in the list of vibrations. Yes. Or some some other course of these. Yes. And so all of your lines are like S1 to like. Yeah, to the, the yeah, S1 to the 2R, except some of them which are singular. Yeah. Uh, sorry, they're, 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 they're half the dimensional head or quarter dimensional head? Half the dimension. Half the dimension. So they're only half the dimension. Yeah. Half the dimension. Yeah, they're only like Lagrangian or special Lagrangian, so correct. Appropriate. No, that's supposed to be half the dimension before. I think you're counting. Ah, no, okay, the things I'm counting are discs, so they are just. Sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. They yeah. are. It's the disk, the M, the M and the Lagrangian. Yes. Yeah, so the disk uh, always real dimension two, complex dimension one. And it's true, issue happens to be in a, in a case where R equal one, where the M has complex dimension two, then it should be true that this disk happens to be half dimensional. But in general, they would just be very small dimension into a very much uh, higher dimensional space. Yeah, no, I wasn't. Uh, the the Lagrangian is Lagrangian in what? Uh, uh, in your original example, they think we're ending the um the, the, the things we're ending on a on a on a circle in fiber, right? Yeah, that's right. So yeah, so it's always okay that this disk end on some circle inside the fiber. Right. Yeah. So the, 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 the Lagrangian half dimensional in the part over the base. It's not half dimensional in the entire end. Right? Um, I mean, the Lagrangian. Lagrangian sorry, sorry, I'm completely confused. There is, we have seen fiber of this vibration, which is a torus yes. of half dimension inside M. Yes. And we have it is a Lagrangian inside M. But I thought you wanted uh, how do you specify? Okay, never mind. Yeah, I'll never mind. Okay, yeah. No, I still not mind. What's confusing me is that in the people example. Yeah, we come to that. Yes. There and uh four real dimensions. Yes. Um, the object you're counting are two dimensional. Yes. But to specify the boundary condition, I just, I'm specifying a circle. I'm not specifying a Lagrangian. I'm still specifying a Lagrangian, a torus, which would contain the boundary circle of the disk. I don't fix the circle, I fix the torus. Okay, the object looks like this. I mean, I mean, I fix the homology class of the circle okay. inside the torus. So his gamma is related to the homology class of this circle inside the torus. I'm sorry, never mind. Yes, you're right. Yeah, I was confused. So this thing is a kind of quite vague statement, but supposed to give an idea of the general 
kind of expectation. And yeah, I've listed a number of evidence for that. So there is a story of Gaiotomo and ASCII, which explain how from the DPS spectrum of such four dimensional series, you should be able to recover the apicalar geometry of the space uh, M. Well, yes. Why is that evidence for this expectation? Yeah, so I do, it's not an evidence. It's only an evidence if I combine it with a second point. Ah. Well, the second point is uh, some more uh, SYZ uh, mirror symmetry, where each time you have this kind of torus vibration into a special Lagrangians, the way uh, you should uh, cook up uh, the mirror should involve exactly this kind of uh, holomorphic disk with boundary on the various uh, torus fibers. But, but isn't that, wouldn't that mean that the BPS spectrum should be related to the hypercalar geometry of the mirror? Yes, and so exactly. So to get an evidence, I need to say the last thing, which <laughs> is that this hypercalar geometry should be roughly self-mirror. Oh, okay. But, but, but that, 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 I mean, how to say that, that's, uh, um, uh, you, you, you've eaten the whole Langlands program into that roughly. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. And in particular, I guess if you want to make it fully precise, you know, this is discussion. Maybe in long rounds, you have G and the dual G and long rounds dual group. Yeah. And definitely the two things are not really the same. Yeah. And to actually to make it fully precise, there is some finite group issues that maybe the, the true Coulomb branch is maybe not really the modulus space of fixed bundles, but some kind of finite cover or finite quotient. Uh -huh. And uh, but yeah, let, let me forget this. this mm -hmm. but, but in the example where, 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 where this has been done, the uh, then the disk can't be used to produce the mirror as well. The disk cannot, and we don't know. From what I recall. That's true. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, that's right. I no longer understand the objection about generic theta because yeah, to make sense of I also need to fix the symplectic form, right? So I fix the symplectic form omega theta, and then I need to pick a corresponding complex structure. And I can take J theta, but I cannot take how crazy others. No, no, you could take many of them. You, you, I, I mean, you're, you're not fixed to take J theta. Yeah, so I'm saying if I want to view it as a like special case of ordinary mirror symmetry where I start with just a symplectic manifold. Yeah. I fix my real symplectic form to be small omega theta. Yeah. And I want to say if I want to do symplectic geometry for that, I need to pick a compatible complex structure. I mean, tamed is enough, right? So you can- Yeah, yeah that's right. The tame, tame complex structure. And there are a lot of choices, that's right. Yeah. But so, but it's clear J theta is the okay choices. But maybe is it true that J theta prime for different theta prime? Yeah, right. sure. I mean, the, the, like an open set of J's near J theta will be okay. Yeah, that's why you claim it's open. I, I, yeah. I mean, the, the business about this wall crossing formula, it's not from counting. I mean, it, it's about Maslow zero disks. Yeah, yes, yes, exactly. Disks or it, it's about when you try and move this, when you, when you try and move the fiber in a one parameter family, then you'll pick up that disk at some moment and it will correct yeah, exactly. the coordinate change. Yeah. Yeah, so I claim that it's compatible with what Oru and all are doing when they study wall crossing for um, this with boundary. Yes, in some way, yes. Yeah, I mean, except, yeah, in general, it does not, yeah, in general, yeah, I mean, in, in general, it's difficult to make sense of Count of mass of, but definitely the thing which is easier to do is to count mass of index two disk 
you get some kind of potential and then see how does this potential changes under various changes. I, I don't understand what you mean. I, I don't think it's difficult to make sense of the count of Maslow zero disks. You can count with moving Lagrangian boundary conditions, like in one parameter family. Yes, that's why you can do that. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah, you can do that. Okay, so the very rough combination of these two points that is a story where you take as input is kind of count of disk, some kind of mural story, you produce some geometry. You have the Kyoto Monaski, where you take as input is kind of EPF or DT environments, you produce another geometry. And if you believe that these two ways to construct your geometry are the same, it's likely that these two inputs are the same. There is a related fact that there is a wall crossing story on both sides. So, so, so what, what, why, is, why isn't that a proof of this equality? Yeah, so it will be a proof in the case we care about somehow, it's a proof up to some kind of understanding of what the appropriate initial data are. So my wall crossing is telling you, if you know that this thing is true somewhere, then it's true somewhere else. Yeah. So the prime is to start somewhere. Ah, uh, okay. And yeah, essentially the example I will describe, uh, if we understand well enough the initial thing, then it will be a proof. Uh. And, and these kind of initial thing are related to what happens near the discriminant locus. Oh. Yeah, and so yeah, it's a proof. And if you also know that these two wall crossing structure exist on both sides, which. But it may be okay. And I will uh, maybe I skip the last one because I will come back to it. Okay. Yeah, so here are a number of uh, problems to make sense of the general expectation. So, for example, this embedding of this base B in the space of safety condition is not known in general. And maybe defining this count of disk might be difficult in, uh, yeah. in general. But is maybe Vivek disagree because Vivek just. So maybe you just consider one parameter family and looks to what is the, maybe just a little. Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe it's okay, but oh, okay. I would like to, to see it written down maybe. From, from... Oh, okay. I mean, I guess it's some problem about showing that that count uh, is invariant under deforming the family. That, that that's some further problem. Yes, 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 that's all, yes, yes, kind of, yes. Yeah. Okay, so I will. Uh, yeah, so here is some list. So yes, yeah, so I claim there are examples where actually this expectation is realized. Where in the few examples I know, these kind of issue with disk is uh, confirmed by using some algebra geometric definition of these counts, where the count of this holomorphic disk, somehow in some cases, after appropriate degeneration, you can close this disk into spheres, and then you need to count closed curve with appropriate uh, conditions. So the story of log logarithmic or of Witter invariance, which sometimes can be used to define some numbers. Yes. In the story that I looked at, yes. the potential itself was invariant. Yes. Yeah, so the, the disk so the disk comes didn't were changed at the wood body so there was some classic information. All right, of course, we're still the story on the story. Yeah, that's also so, so like the potential maybe. Yeah, so this is the story. Yeah, that's yeah. Okay, so so just uh, here to just remember, in some cases you can make sense of this count through something I will take as a black box, which is the log of Kromov written uh, invariance. In the example I will describe, actually, I will be using and see the black box. And this black box is those things used by Gross and Zibet, which try to make sense of this picture of 
mirror symmetry. If dual torus vibration is corrected by all of the disk, if they try to make sense of it uh, algebra geometrically, and they develop this log of common language. Okay, now I will come to uh, to a very specific example. Well, on the DT side, I will count current shifts on local P2. And one of the reasons to focus on this example is actually one of the few examples where the expanded embedding in the space of bridge on stability conditions is known. That uh, the sample charge given by this explicit period really can be viewed as defining some uh, notion of stability in the sense of bridge on. And then, for example, this thing is useful is, for example, if I want to make some real proof that the wall crossing formula works as it should, it's useful to know that. Yeah, so essentially, in this case of local P2, it goes back to Bayer and Macri around uh, uh, 10 years ago. So actually, we use the, the result as some kind of initial input in what uh, we will do. Okay, so we consider local P2, so total space of O minus 3 over P2, so this is non compact Calabria threefold. Inside it has this uh, zero section, which is P2. And we'll consider the bounded derived category of current shift on X, which are set theoretically supported on uh, P2. So we restrict our uh, thing uh, to shifts, which are somehow localized on the zero section, maybe infinitesimally close to the uh, zero section. So maybe in general, the shift has some kind of scheme theoretic support, which can some non reduced scheme which can flatten in the fiber direction. So we allow that, but uh, nothing more. Okay, so in particular, usual current shift on P2 live inside that by a push forward. And I will always, what I denote by O of N is always a push forward by the zero section of the usual line bundle O of N on P2. Okay, so it's something which is supported on the zero section, supported on the surface zero uh, outside. Okay, so in physics language, we are looking at D4, D2, D0 brains, but not D6. We don't look at uh, sheaves which are gen generically non-zero. For example, we don't look at ideal sheaves. Only uh, things supported near the zero section. And now, if you take this Calabio threefold and run our story, there should be a corresponding four dimensional theory. So, actually, if you are careful with the decoupling of gravity, there is really a five dimensional theory coming from M theory on this X. And then this theory as a field theory is really this five dimensional field theory compactified on a circle. So, maybe some people will call that 5D rather than 4D because it's like 5D compactified on a circle. But that, for my purposes, I want to view it as an example of something which at low energy looks four dimensional. And then I need to say what is this M, what is this hypercalor geometry. So in this case, it will be the family of elliptic curves. And this family of elliptic curves has a very nice, completely uh, explicit description as being the universal family of elliptic curve over a modular curve. So what I claim is that B minus the discriminant locus is naturally identified with the quotient of the upper half plane by the congruence subgroup gamma one of three. And uh, let's say that this thing is a, predicted to be the correct answer. It's maybe one way to Aggregate is uh, through string duality or through mirror, mirror symmetry. So yes, as I will mention at some point, this, fami this family of elliptic curves, you can also think about it as being some family of mirror curves for P2 or local P2. Sorry, we'll yes. Was yeah, so here in the example, R is equal to one. So B is just C, just a complex plane. And delta will consist of, yeah, actually there is some three to one cover at issue at some point. So 
I guess in what I've described here, delta is already one point. Okay. But there is also actually some orbifold point too. So actually, the, at the end of the day, if you compute the universal cover of this stacky thing, you get this congruence subgroup gamma one of three. Okay, so gamma one of three, there are two by two matrices in SL2Z, which are equal to one modulo three. Well, pro, um, well, correctly, which are upper triangular with one on the diagonal modulo three, so something very explicit inside SL2Z. So it's acting on the upper half plane. Here I've drawn one a fundamental domain. And uh, on this fundamental domain, there are several special points. There is a point on the real axis that I call C, which is a conifold point. There's a point at infinity, which is a large volume point. So like in modular curve language, there is two cusps for this modular uh, curve. And in addition, there are two orbifold points that are by O or O prime, which will be identified when I uh, glue the boundary of the fundamental domain. So really, if I do the quotient of the upper half plane by the action of gamma one of three, I get something which is some kind of sphere minus two points. I have the two points at infinity, conifold large volume. And I have this extra orbifold point when I have the Z minus three automorphism the group. And actually it will be slightly easier to work, okay. On the three to one cover of B prime, B prime of B where I just resolve the orbifold point. I just take some three to one cover and once I take this three to one cover, I get some base, which is honestly C minus three points without any non-trivial orbifold structure. And I just pull back the universal family of elliptic curves and I get C family. Yeah, so I should just say a modular curve uh, by definition, always parameterized elliptic curve with extra data. So there is naturally corresponding family of elliptic curve. So much simpler, a point in the upper half plane is an elliptic curve. So here over each point of the upper half plane has the corresponding elliptic curve. Yeah, sure. On the C1, one Yes, so there is another one on the real axis here, yeah, tau equal to zero. Right. Ah, no, actually, the, the three singular points come from the cusp, actually, oh. from, from this conifold point. Okay. The orbifold point is supposed to be this smooth point in the middle. Okay. So at the orbifold point, everything is smooth, nothing is singular. Mm -hmm. After I take this three to one cover, in particular, the fiber is smooth. Okay. And the fiber is singular only at these three points, which come from the unique conifold point before. And I think that's very correct, yes. So sorry, the, yeah. So in the deep there's no orbital point because they were the arms back. Yes, yes, that's right. And the what's the conifold point? The, the thing that yeah, that's right. So I have three points where the elliptic curve is singular, and I call them all conifold points. Okay. So another claim is that in this example, you can realize much, most of the expectations. So, in particular, the universal cover of this base. So, if you take this base minus uh, three points, you take the universal cover. Is okay. So actually, the universal cover is just the upper half plane because this thing comes from quotient of the upper half plane. So it's just the upper half plane. The claim is that the upper half plane has a well defined map to the space of bridge on safety condition on this derived category of sheaves on P2, where the central charge is given by the expected uh, formula. And I guess. Yeah, maybe I will. Uh, Skip that. And so the point of that, once you have uh, this picture, once you can interpret each point of the upper half plane as a notion of stability condition, you can really do the Donaldson Thomas theory. You can consider moduli spaces. If you fix gamma and if you fix the point tau in the upper half plane, you can cook a moduli space of semi stable objects of class gamma where the stability is defined by tau. So you get some honest. Uh, 
algebraic varieties. And then you can extract numbers out of them, which in simplest cases are something like topological other characteristics of these moduli spaces. Okay. So in particular, uh, in this story, they're well-defined, mathematically well-defined number, omega gamma of tau, so where tau is a point in the upper half length. And gamma in general is something, something like a churn character. And here, because P2 has some H0, H2, and H4, gamma is something like a triple of four integer of three integers, and like D0 charge, D2 charge, and D4 charge. Okay, so we have these numbers, and the wall crossing happens for these numbers as a function of the point tau in the upper half plane. And what uh, we will uh, do first is to study these numbers by organizing them into uh, pictures, into trees in the upper half planes. And on this table, obviously, you, you say you know they are, but they're not simple. Ah, so, so part of the problem of having a brilliant safety condition is that in the data you have what I know by A of tau, which is some kind of abelian category inside the triangulated category of all complexes of shapes. And to define this module space, we should only take objects inside this abelian piece. And in general, what is difficult is to find what is the correct abelian piece to consider. And you know, so we know that. So it's part of the claim of the the construction of Bayan Macrians, which is a thing which is maybe not obvious from the physics point of view. I don't know a simple physics derivation. Or maybe it's obvious. It's, so in particular, it's not made of usual sheaves. It's made really of complexes of sheaves. And they are really a complexes of two sheaves of length two. And there is some, um, some description. So essentially it is obtained by tilting of the obvious category of sheaves. And roughly it only depends on the, on the real part of tau. So the, I have the upper half plane. Maybe I have tau. And it only depends that if I call real part of tau equal to mu. But the actual special charge function is some of the density function of tau. It's not simple, Yeah, that's right. The actual z is a transcendental function of tau. Okay. But uh, the, the, this abelian art is something which somehow is, does not depend in a transcendental way on tau. So if you have a real number mu, you have a notion of slope stability for sheaves. You can just take the quotient of the degree divided by the rank and get a notion of slope. And if a sheaf has slope bigger than mu, you keep it in your abelian category. But if this shift has slope smaller than mu, you take is shift by one in the Dirac category inside your abelian category. And why is that the right thing to do? And for example, it is clearly the right thing to do if you want your source of charge to lie inside the upper half plane. So in general, Z is a complex number. And uh, yeah, roughly this art give you a notion of like particle versus anti particle. Okay. No, but it's fine description about what you said about what what other. Uh, yes. You're basically saying that there's something like two non quivers, right? That 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 is something like that that that, that lets you build all the other objects. And maybe not as simple as a quiver, but then everything. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's a bit similar to what you get you know, from the quiver description, yes. Yeah, so you're saying that everything in the heart is... Um, ah, and, and actually, yeah, maybe... Okay, I, I made a mistake. This description is only correct if tau live inside one standard fundamental domain, that you have such simple description. If you are outside the fundamental domain, if you're in another fundamental domain, you go from there to there by applying a natural or to equivalence of the Dirac category, 
and this thing can mix a thing around. Like your two. No, the Yeah, that's right. So the claim is that there is a module space for the complexes. You actually know that you can describe it the way we know how to describe it in the module. Yeah, maybe in this case it's like cheating, but there is also the usual quiver description of the of the DRF category. And you can actually argue that this module space is a special case, can always be realized as a module space of queer representation for appropriate stability with a quiver. The basic thing is quite indirect. I mean, with some appropriate technology to deal with module space of complexes, there should, there should be some like general proof in the same way that module space of shift or module spaces, module spaces of complexes under or stable complexes under a good assumption should form module spaces. And maybe by now it's known, maybe by now people working with bridge and stability conditions maybe have proved such um, this kind of statement. I mean, I, I think it's almost obvious that they form like an algebraic space from just, uh, but, but knowing things like productivity and so on, it's less obvious. Yeah. And... Yeah. Actually, I, I have a question about this yeah. uh, this stability condition. Um, I mean, I mean, this uh, this 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 KP two is a toric variety, and we you, yeah. know, you know mirror symmetry for for toric varieties. Um, is this uh, does this stability condition look any more sensible on the mirror? Yeah, so I don't know the, the answer. I mean, certainly the, the central charge looks like the usual central charge, like just integrating the holomorphic volume form. Yeah. But I don't know what the art uh, look like. Yeah, actually, it's a good question. If you know more you call mirror symmetry, you take this art, a billion category inside, yeah. and try to make sense of it on the Lagrangian side. I don't know, actually. I see. I'm only giving the heart yeah, that's part of the question. So I think, or either a nice description of what it is. I don't know. Uh, actually, I'm not going to question. Yeah. I'm not going to the pairs of the three points. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not, I don't know. Okay, so we have these numbers. And now we will organize uh, this number into a picture. So we're scattering diagram. And to do that, we pick a phase, theta, number modulo two pi integers. And then you draw the following loci into the upper half plane. If you fix a class gamma, you can draw R gamma plus of theta, which are all the points tau in, tau in the upper half plane, where the sort of charge Z gamma at this point tau has argument equal to theta. So the sort of charge has phase theta. And moreover, such that the corresponding uh, DT environment is non zero. So, in general, it's true that Z gamma of tau, if I fix gamma, Z gamma of tau is some kind of complicated holomorphic function of tau. But if I look to where is this, where are the values of this function of phase theta, it will define me some curve inside the upper half plane. It should be some kind of transcendental curve. And I look at this uh, locus. And in addition, I impose that uh, the corresponding DT environment is non zero. If the corresponding DT environment is zero and this locus, I don't include it in my picture. So, for example, I claim here is the upper half plane. 
And you can take gamma to be the class of the line model O on P2, pure D4 brain. And you can compute this function Z gamma of tau and see where is it. Yeah, so actually in this picture, I guess I took theta equal pi over two, I think. Yeah, so I've forgotten my convention. I guess I took theta equal pi over two. I looked to where are the points in the upper half plane where the corresponding sum of charge is equal, is purely imaginary. So phase is pi over two. And the corresponding locus happens to be this line here. And it's a single line. And if I ask the same question for the line model O minus one shifted by one, I get the other line here. And if I ask the same question for the structure shift of a line in P2, so if I look to a line in P2, if I look to the like pure D2 branch, just the line model over this line, and if I do the same exercise, I'll find this vertical straight line here ending here. And the claim will be that this a picture will encode information about the wall crossing happening with this number. And the claim will be that the wall crossing will be happening when this is various curves uh, intersect. But by construction, if I am at a point of intersection of two such arrays, one for gamma one, the other for gamma two, it means along the first one, I have an object of class gamma one of phase theta. Along gamma two, I have another object of the same phase theta. So exactly at the intersection point, I have two objects where the two sums of charge are the same phases. They are both parallel, which is where you expect a possible wall crossing. So which is why, yeah, I don't have to do computation accurate to find that actually, yes, yeah, somewhere there is a wall, but from drawing the two curve, I know that here at this point, I am in the wall where thing can, can change. So what's the accurate principle for the Yeah, O of L, L is supposed to be a line in P2. So it's like a, just trivial line bundle supported on a curve, like wrong zero on P2, but just supported on a curve. And so the general picture of this wall crossing will be this scattering picture where you have rays uh, coming together. And when they intersect, they produce new rays. And what's uh, effectively. In the middle? You mean here in the middle? Uh, so I see the vertical one. Yes. But what are like the. Other one. Uh, so it, between O and O shift. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. So, so actually, the picture is very complicated. Actually, here, I come the infimini rays. Yeah, and and so, no, in general, they can be very complicated. Uh, they, they can be shifts, just complicated shifts. Um, ah, in general, no. So, I mean, actually in this spectrum, if I take part of a two, this place is not zero before point. Actually for a different value of, uh, this thing is a picture if I happen to take set equal part of a two. As we'll see in one moment, if I take set equal to zero, then the initial thing will intersect at the orbital point. But only if I pick a particular phase. So I have one such picture for every phase, theta. And for set equal part of a two, it looks, it starts like that. And this intersection point is not the orbital point. But it's not with power. So so there are three independent charges that are yes. there. So you have a there. That, that's what I mean. That point. Yeah, another way to say it is that at this point, the three things align, but actually uh, they happen to be all real. When, yeah. I mean, they align a particular phase. So I will only see that if I happen to take theta equal to zero. So if I want to see this point, if I pick theta, I only see object of phase theta. Right. And at the orbital point, all the three sorts of charge are real, so I will only see it if I take theta equal to zero. So in it, I will see it, but just not on this picture. You know what the server is at that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. It could be the, the usual thing. And so the kind of uh, theorem is that some of these pictures that you can draw if you know all the numbers, omega, gamma, tau, 
actually you can reconstruct it. Yeah, and to be more than a picture, I should say that each of the rays in this picture should be decorated by a corresponding generating function, generating series of the DT invariants or BPS states. Wait, when you say that, sorry, that, that's weird, it's one of the fiber rule of the usual one of the 333. Actually, it's certainly not the previous picture because you you think that it's not workable. But there, there is no mm, there is no quiver here. Oh, there should be. Well, if all three you do a line, that is on each. In other words, you will get two. It's just not all the all the category that one. You cannot have. It. But but here only two aligns, not three. Oh, not three. Not That's three. Right. Not two of. Them. Oh. Yes. So it would be only at the true orbital point that for okay. some value of set as a three will align and give a quiver description. Yes. No, here I don't know. Oh, no, the three of so it's just uh, whatever you get from the zero, but it's putting a zero, but it's keeping with that rate. Yeah. 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 By yes, yes, okay. yeah, 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 that's right. Exactly on this picture, there is not one orbifold point, but there is actually an orbifold point for every element in gamma one of three. And indeed, if you look to all possible mutations of this quiver, uh, up to finite things are naturally in correspondence with gamma one of three. Actually, there is some kind of infinite trees of all possible uh, quiver mutations. And which corresponds to the fact that in this upper half there are like infinite mini orbital points. And uh, yeah, so I guess if I pick a fundamental domain, my kind of standard orbital point would be the usual 3 c two. But then yeah, I go from one fundamental domain to another one, but an action of an element in gamma one of three, it corresponds to some mutation or some sequence of mutations. Okay, so the theorem. Is that this picture, and actually with the numerical information of the DT environments, can be uniquely reconstructed from explicit initial rays coming from the conical points plus an explicit uh, scattering algorithm, especially the Conservi Sandman formula, imposed at each intersection points of the rays. So on this, okay, maybe let me tell. tell I tell you what are the initial rays. So on this upper plane picture, there are infinitely conifold points. So for example, at tau equal to zero, I have one conifold point, which is a point where uh, the, just the line model O gets its standard charge becoming zero. Uh, 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 Pierre? Yes. Uh, just the, 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 the so, so the, the content of that theorem is that some part of this diagram is empty. Is that the content of the theorem? So the content of the theorem is that, let me say it like that. So I can orient these rays, yeah. depending if the standard charge increases or not. And the content of this theorem is that somehow if you follow, if you start somewhere, and if you yeah. go, let's say, in the opposite from the arrows I put, and you follow, and at an intersection point, you choose one way to continue, and so on. Yeah. Then at some point, you will arrive at the conifold point. Uh, OK. And the corresponding DT invariant will be equal to one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's some yeah, so it's really some kind of thing that there are simple initial data from which you can reconstruct the full picture. So how do you get the data from the chaos? From the Oh, the picture. Yes. The yeah, yeah, that's why each time the two rays intersect, you can apply the concept of some of my work or thing for the last year. Oh, that uh, these guys are stable since you know. Yeah, that's why it's kind of. Yeah, that's why. 
Yeah, that's right. That's right. You can really show that these numbers counting these bridge on stable objects in this Calabio 3 category, they really uh, satisfy the conservi sum and more processing formula. And so it's really a correct description of what's happening here. Yeah. Wouldn't by the scheduling diagram here just because yeah, just a union of all these rays. Uh, okay, of these rays decorated by generating series of the invariants. But this is amazing. I mean, the concept of sovereign form was impossible to be made to know the world. We couldn't figure out n. But here, you said for these two guys, you can actually figure out what, and for each one of them. Yeah, yeah, so but it will not be so simple. You think it's only a part of the picture, then you need to iterate it. But but still, yeah, from the abstract point of view, some point of view, the, maybe the most nice thing to say is find a point where you know the full BPS spectrum. And then the walk thing from there to the point you care about. And here it's different in the sense yeah. that we don't look for a point where you know the full thing. But somehow, if you fix the phase data, then there are points where the set of PPS environment of phase theta is simple. So I'm saying, like, near this conifold point, if you move along this ray, there are only one BPS state of phase theta. Yeah. Maybe there are many others of different phases that I don't know about, but they are irrelevant for this picture. But somehow all the complication will come from how the initial thing interact uh, later. Yeah, right. Because you first yeah. ask for the, the BPS to generate these objects, and then you ask an object with some part. Yes. It's still a very difficult problem because you have to run the yeah, that's all. all the possible data and they all yeah. I mean, I mean, actually, if you care about an object at a specific point, you can look actually, I mean, you know what theta you should take. The theta should be the phase of this object at this point. So you know, if you care about the BPS generation of an object of like gamma at a specific modulus, then you know what is the center charge of your object at this point. You just take theta to be the phase of this center charge. It is a correct theta to pick. Okay. So you know what theta you want. And then the problem is to construct this scattering diagram D of theta. Yeah. So you know the initial thing and you need to run until you find the object you care about. And really, if you have a fixed uh, class in mind, this thing is a finite algorithm, which will produce the answer. But... Uh, if I what I... The guy that is um, at all the different conical points, right? Yeah. They, they don't all have the same part. They have three different, they have three different parts. So, so I actually, on the upper, upper half band, there are really infimini conical points. And so there are really infimini charges, which are really the charges of all possible exceptional objects on P2. So it's actually like maybe the line model O of one of two and all the possible mutations. So there is a series of, but, but, but still, we, we know them actually. It's got a specific values of charges, right? You have to decompose it. Ah. There isn't many ways of decomposing. Okay. Okay. okay, okay. So, so, so in our paper, we spend some time to write bound. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. Yeah, you, that's why you might worry that picture is infinite because they're infinitely initial things, yeah. but you can bound what happened. And it's roughly because, uh, because the, like how much you travel is related to the mass of your objects, like the, the absolute value of the central charge increases. So if you care about an object of a specific mass, like a specific absolute value of the central charge, if you come from very, very far, your mass will have increased more than what you care about. So you can prove some bound. So, so I guess probably what you write is not optimum in any way, but definitely we, we wrote something saying like, definitely if you move too much in the horizontal direction, you can prove that this Z gamma has to increase by some amount. So it uses some information about what this function Z gamma of tau looks like. And uh, on, on the, for example, the bound on real part of tau, like the conifold points are all on the real axis. Between. Yeah, so yeah, you might complain this thing is not enough, what I just said, because even if I bound the range, there are still infinitely conifold points in the middle because conifold points are some kind of rational points in the 
in, in the middle, but yeah, I guess we bond uh, something. Uh, I guess we do something better at some point, which says there are only finitely many initial uh, things which can contribute. Is there vanishes on a conical point? Yeah, that's what the Z gamma tau vanishes as the conical point. Yeah, so here, because there are infinite conical points, and for each conical point, there are infinite many initial things. So as I said, for a specific thing, everything is finite, everything is whatever, which are all the shifts of a given exceptional object. Okay, maybe I will skip that. So here, the more uh, concrete picture of what happened is theta is equal to pi over two. So you can show that the picture looks like that. And here, what is nice is that in C's, if you care about the upper part, for example, the geometric looking stability, like Giesecker stability, lives in the near infinity up. And so, if you care about what happens infinity up, actually, for theta equal pi over two, you can argue that only C's conical points at integer points do contribute. So, somehow, there are initial rays coming from other conical points, but they stay here, they never enter these collection of fundamental domains. So here, actually, if I have a bound like that, it's really enough. If I say for a given object, the so set of manifold points is bounded here, I really have um, finitely many possibilities. Yeah, and here, so here the picture, I have initial, two initial things intersect, I apply concept of my crossing formula, I get new rays, but then I can have further intersection where I still need to produce new rays, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So here there are the walls in C's language, which are not the same thing as a walls of marginal stability, in, which is a usual confusing thing. Um, so in the scattering diagram language, is right thing as the walls. And it's a very good question. Like in C story, there are like broken lines. You can ask what is the meaning of the broken line in C story? And the short answer is I, I don't know. Ah, and here is the answer for set equal to zero, which is uh, exactly what Mina was saying. From the three different conifold points, they all come at the orbifold point. Because he thinks theta equal to zero, the central charges are all real. And at the orbifold point, the three central charges are real. So this point here is on the triple intersection of these three things. And here there is something else amazing happening, which is there is some intersection at the orbifold point, but then things go straight to infinity. There is no extra intersections. So like this is. This picture is somewhat degenerate. In general, there are many of double, there are many double intersections. And here there is essentially a single triple intersections and uh, nothing else. Which means that for particular classes of objects, essentially you can, so actually, yeah, we just recovered something which actually was known a long, long time ago, actually in Dreze and Le Potier in the 80s already knew that, that for some classes of objects, the modulus space of geometric stable sheaves is actually the same thing as the modulus space of quiver representation of these three nodes quiver without any wall crossing. Actually, if your object has slope between zero and minus one, you can go from one to zero the without wall crossing. And this thing is a pictorial proof of it. That uh, they're exactly the objects we are captured by this thing. And we just go from the orbifold to large volume without any wall crossing. Yeah, and so at this point, there is a quiver description. And actually, you can use this picture to say something about the quiver, but I will skip, I will skip that. Okay, so this thing with the, the DT side, on the DT side, you can construct this picture by looking where do you get an object of a given phase? 
now I want to arrive at the other side. In the other side, I'm supposed to talk about holomorphic curves. And uh, very uh, roughly, this picture of trees, which will appear as tropical, tropical curves, tropical limits of these uh, holomorphic uh, curves. So here is the expectation is that if you fix the phase theta, then the corresponding scattering diagram d theta should describe j theta holomorphic disk in size is geometry m, I guess m versus m prime where just is three to one cover. You can forget about it. Okay, so my upper color geometry was this family of elliptic curves, but I can put it back to the universal cover as really a family of elliptic curve over the upper half plane. And the general expectation is that this DT count should be related to count of holomorphic curve inside this family of elliptic curve. And uh, you can look through the image of uh, this curve through the projection to the base, you get some kind of picture. And the claim is that in some appropriate or tropical limit, you should recover the kind of trees that we just described. And to make uh, this thing precise, we need to know uh, something like I said, maybe in general, I don't really know how to define count of holomorphic disk. Maybe I want to do some kind of algebra or geometry count of these curves. And for that, I need to know what my geometry looks like for specific complex structures. In general, if I have an apicular manifold, I have a twister sphere of complex structure, and maybe if I know what one point looks like as a complex manifold, maybe I don't really know what another point looks like as a, no, as a different complex manifold. It might be not obvious to identify which one it is. And yeah, the claim is that for the specific geometry we care about, at least for two points, theta equal pi over two and theta equal to zero, I know what the geometry is as a complex manifold. For theta equal pi over two, this geometry is this complement P2 minus E, the complement of the smooth cubic inside the projective plane. It's an affine algebraic variety. But for theta equal to zero, actually I get back an elliptic fabrication. Maybe it's something which is quite confusing. So in general, I have, so in general, I have I, and for I, I have an elliptic fabrication. But then I count holomorphic curve for complex structure, which are uh, like for in the, on the orthogonal circle. And what I'm saying is that for one of these points, I get an affine variety, like for j equal pi over two. But for another point, I get again an elliptic fabrication, j zero, which actually is the same as this point. So this thing is something which never happens for like x bundles or uh, each in system. So for example, for simple x bundles, there is some sister action, which tell you that all the complex structures which are different from i and minus i are all the same. Actually, they're all affine character varieties. So this thing is related to the 5D origin of this thing. Somehow, like this thing, the elliptic fabrication come from 4D to 3D compactified on a circle. But is a 4D already coming from a 5D circle? Actually, there are two circles, and you can choose which one you pick. And so actually, there is it explains this kind of strange phenomenon that it's uh, actually there is some kind of twin power fabrication in this geometry. So in both cases, you can identify what is a variety as an algebraic variety. Actually, it's not just as a complex manifold, but actually this thing are just algebraic variety. So you can do algebraic geometric definition of the count of curves. And there is a theorem telling you the cis picture at pi equal theta equal pi over two. Also encode appropriate count of holomorphic curves inside this geometry P2 minus E. And so combining the two results together, we get the expected correspondence between DT invariance on one side and count of curves on the other side. So now, the difficult thing is to show that the mother is the same like wall crossing type of formula on both sides, and there are both some kind of initial data on both sides. Okay, so I'm skipping. So, sorry, yes. in this case, you actually know how to do this. Yeah, that's right. So, through some algebra geometric trick, I gave some algebra geometric definition of some numbers, which should be the same as if someone gives some honest definition of this, you should agree with this number. But yeah, definitely there is some 
precise definition of these numbers and we prove that they are all the expected properties. And we can prove the same thing for theta equal to zero. So for theta equal to zero, we get a different geometry, not P2 minus E, but it's additive combustion. We can count curves inside these thing and we can um, capture by this picture. And so for this different value of theta, we also get a precise correspondence. Okay, so this thing has a, a kind of two precise results. I cannot prove for generic theta because for general theta, I don't really know what it is as a complex manifold. But for two specific theta, I know what it is and then I can curve there and match this picture with a kind of a scattering picture on the GT side. I'm probably already over time, right? <laughs> Should I? I, I think the seminar tends to have no fixed time limit. <laughs> yeah, it is what I remember from the last time. <laughs> okay. so are there any questions? So this thing was like some of the, the uh, concrete results about these concrete examples. And the last part is back to slightly speculative things. things. Okay, so the point is that really we have these uh, this picture, which are entirely precise picture, and you can really prove mathematically that they give some algorithm to compute DT invariants. You can prove that they give algorithm to compute some count of holomorphic curves in this upper geometry, and you can prove these two algorithms are the same, and so particularly you can prove the expected correspondence. Yeah, yeah, the slide actually the last time I spoke here, I spoke about one of the application actually. So the last time I spoke here, I only knew the theta equal pi over two story. So the point of this more recent paper with Piolin, De Comp, the flock is to do that, is to prove the reconstruction result for any phase. And for that, it's really necessary to use a physical source of charge. Right? In some earlier work, I obtained this picture using some kind of truncated, approximated source of charge, which are not the real physics one. But which are enough for some for some application. For example, last time as a kind of entirely different story, but which uses this circle of identity to prove that if you look at the local P2 to the topological string is in the class of shutter VD limit, or to prove that it satisfies the expected holomorphic anomaly equation. The story on itself is somehow by using this, was using this, this correspondence. Okay, so the last thing I want to discuss is about the origin of this general correspondence. And the claim is that for the case of P2, you can give some reasonably uh, heuristic explanation of why things are working, which somehow uses the fact that local P2 or precisely smear geometry or this M is of low enough dimension is complex dimension two. So that you can make some argument essentially by either you can say by standard string dualities or actually by qualitatively understandable geometric uh, argument. So the claim is that, okay, so the question we have in this example is, what is the reason to expect that we can obtain a comparison between on one side current shears on local P2 and on the other side is J theta holomorphic curves inside the corresponding Coulomb branch or subject return integral system M. And here there is some uh, something which is some kind of uh, coincidence, which is that this hyperkeller geometry M is closely related to the mirror uh, geometry. So in general, the mirror of local P2 will be another non-compact Calabria threefold, which will have an equation of the form maybe UV equal pi minus T. And the claim is that pi is exactly this map from N to B. But to say, in other words, is Y is a non-compact Calabria threefold. And it's a, fibra it's a fabrication in affine quadrics over our M, where this fabrication is a degenerate over one of the fibers of this fabrication. So it's a standard description of the mirror of local P2, except maybe in the standard description, you don't really see this M, this hyperkele stuff, maybe you see C star squared. But M is a partial compactification of this star squared. Sure, so you're Y. Yeah. Who comes that information? Okay. 
Y is one complex dimension higher than N. What is T? Ah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, T is a fixed number. So I should really write Y index T. So T is really some kind of complex moduli for Y. They have a family of Y depending on T. And so somehow you can use that to get some kind of explanation of the correspondence we are talking about, where essentially the explanation is a combination of you know, three steps, maybe in first approximation, it is two steps, where one step is hyperkähler rotation and the second step is mirror symmetry. Very roughly, because we start in complex dimension two, our holomorphic curve happens to be half dimensional. So you can hyperkähler rotate them to get special Lagrangian object. And then it's not so surprising that maybe after mirror symmetry, this special Lagrangian will become some kind of current shift. So more precisely, you start with some kind of holomorphic disk in this torus aberration. And after hyperkähler rotation, you should be able to get special Lagrangian disk where well, the phase of this special Lagrangian is related to this angle theta. Okay, so you start with some kind of holomorphic disk, and after epic rotation, you get some kind of uh, special Lagrangian, open special Lagrangian. So inside complex dimension two, but now you can add complex dimension three by adding these U and V dimensions. And precisely because these uh, so you can go from dimension two Lagrangian to dimension three by multiplying by a circle, which is a circle inside these UV coordinates. But this circle shrink to a point exactly on the fiber where my disk at the boundary. So you can show that actually this open Lagrangian in dimension two leads to a closed Lagrangian in dimension three. So this is probably the process where I'm just doing this for, for all the like, edges. So Fun. Yeah, so definitely this is I definitely Yeah, that's what so the problem, yeah, that's what and this argument in for example works for any local funnel you should go through. So the point I don't know how to turn it to proof because I don't know how to count special Lagrangian. There is some issue why when you do epic no, 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 no. you, you should be able to follow the steps and exactly figure out. What is the constellation to do just by, by knowing the symmetry, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, the mirror symmetry uh, step is fine. We know homological mirror symmetry. Yeah, that's a bit. Very, very special Lagrangian yeah. that is Yeah, but I guess this upper color rotation step is difficult to make precise. Yeah, we need to know that. You know, on the holomorphic disk side, you really count holomorphic disk in a gram of Witten way. In the special Lagrangian side, you count them in a CT way. And there is something to. So obviously, like, 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 like generically, it's okay. Just if everything is smooth and nice, it's fine. Just have a kind of rotation. Yeah, it's a manifold disk, but maybe the, the Lagrangian, maybe are not. Or the disk, holomorphic disk, maybe or not. Like maybe a very confused, like a basic confusing thing is that maybe when you say holomorphic disk, in some M model picture, it's a map from a disk to your variety, not some embedded thing, for example. So like generically, it's embedded, but maybe on the boundary of the modulus space, actually, it's not embedded. Whereas in the naive picture, maybe your Lagrangian like, should be embedded, and so. so yeah, but then you know, where I want to give it on time. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, the, 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 yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so the last step was mirror symmetry. So you close special Lagrangian, you have homological mirror symmetry, and it matches, you get current shifts. Yeah, so that's all. So up to technical details, this thing is saying this correspondence is hyperkähler rotation plus a mirror symmetry. And, uh, and you can say the same thing in some sequence of physics in duality. Now I want to say something about the more general expectation where the M is not of complex dimension two. Well, maybe the M is of higher dimension. So in general, the dimension of M is related like to the rank of the original theory, which has something to do with the cohomology of the Calabi of three form. Can, can you ask nice. actually about this dimension two case? Sorry? Yeah, I have a question about the dimension yes. two case. 
So, so in the dimension two case, um, as you as you write in some of your papers, you can do something richer, where you can count uh, higher genus curves and maybe, you know, like even in the skein or something. Yes, now, yes. Yeah. How is that reflected in the physical origins of the theory? Yeah, I think you can go. If you keep enough of the physics in dimension two, you can explain this fact. But 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 what what, so what, what is the? Hmm? Yeah, at some point you need to use some kind of maybe like. Uh, let me see. Uh, what am I trying to say? You, you don't want to do the other characteristics. You want to do something else, like highlight. Yeah 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 yeah. That, that, that's all. The DT side is some kind of a refined version. And. But, um, but my, my, I mean, my, my question is what original fact about the physics led you to have a two dimensional moduli space, um, which led you to be able to do that? Ah, is the question like, why is the moduli space two dimensional here? Or, or like, how do I use a dimension two for the reason? No, I, I, I mean, how, how to say, it? Um, because, because the dimension is two, yes. you can do some kind of refined countings. But, yeah. Um, ah. Presumably, you should have known that you were going to be able to do those refined countings from the original physics. And so the original physics, like before you did all these reductions, it should have known that the moduli space, I mean, if it knew you could do those refined countings, it should have known that the moduli space was going to be dimension two. So I can say something that, okay, on the DT side, you it's always expected, you should always be able to define some refined number rather than to take some virtual characteristic, yeah, you should be able to take some virtual Poincare polynomial or virtual Kai-Y genus. So these things should always uh, exist. The thing I don't know in general is that at some point on M side, I look, I arrive at some point at some higher genus curves. And And in this sequence of duality, at some point, probably you need to use something like the, I don't know, Ogo Ivafa for summation of some statement about iogenous open curves. Is a fact that is the same thing as some count of M2 brains with some appropriate parameter, like refinement of it. Okay, I see. And and the point is that this standard piece of physics is Ogilvy Rafa is really about uh, like counting open curve with boundary on some Lagrangian in a Calabi of threefold, yeah. roughly. And yeah. and here because we start in dimension two low enough, it can be embedded into a Calabi of three story where I can run this argument. Yeah. So yeah, roughly the dimension is low enough that the modulus space M can be made part of the space time of the string theory, and I can apply various string dualities working for Calabi's threefold, for example, and they go through. So, so, so you, you, you don't expect this refinement to be a part of the story um, otherwise? Actually, I'm confused about that. Uh, so I don't want to say... Okay. I will not say... Yeah, I will not answer this question in this time. Uh -huh, okay. So actually, in what I'm going to say, there will be some kind of refinement, but not the refinement. Why? Is yeah. hmm? uh, okay, so okay, in this refined story, what you produce on the curve side is counting iogenous open curve rather than um, rather than disks, and something which is a bit confusing is that usually counting iogenous curves really make a lot of sense for Calabio's threefold because the virtual dimension, expected dimension is zero, whatever the genus is, so you expect to get natural numbers. But for example, if you go to higher dimension, often the expected dimension for more space of higher genus curves tend to be negative, for example. So if you do some naive count, maybe most of this count will be zero, so it will not be the correct answer. But of course, one might expect better. Maybe we should just have a, a better definition, not use a naive definition and correct it and so on. And probably it's possible, but I, I don't know. 
Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so maybe this is a basic version of the question. Uh, but why is our colon branch two dimensional and how much does it actually matter if it's empty? Because like, this is a pit here, it seems to only really make sense if it's two dimensional. Yeah, that's right. So his argument is only if it's two dimensional. So in general, if I start in that way, so yes, yeah, really two dimensional because P2 has really H2 of dimension one, mm -hmm. right? So there is a one Kelly or symplectic parameter for P2. Coulomb branch is of complex dimension, like the 4D Coulomb branch is complex dimension one and M is of complex dimension two. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, if I take X with a more complicated coulomb, the M will be of higher dimensions. And it is his argument only works if M is of complex dimension two. So the Saturn diagram, but if I ah. have higher dimensions, ah okay. But still, you expect to have a picture like scattering diagrams, mm -hmm. where now it will no longer be raised, because it's conditioned to have a fixed phase. It's actually a real co-dimension one condition. So actually, this thing will not be raised, but will be co-dimension one low side. So the general picture in some higher dimensional 4D Coulomb branch is that you have like hypersurfaces intersecting along co-dimension two loci and so on. But somehow if you look, they intersect on co-dimension two. So if you look transversely to the co-dimension two locus locally, it will look like a two-dimensional picture, rays intersecting mm -hmm. and producing new rays. So like the more locally, the fundamental thing is like two-dimensional. But the kind of full picture will involve higher dimensional uh, so things. Yes, that means it's one way to, to say it, yes. In particular, in higher dimension, the discriminant locus will become so much more complicated. Here, it was just conifold points, a bunch of points. But in higher dimension, it will be co-dimension one thing. So like generically, it will look like transversely as conifold point, but at some places, the discriminant okay. locus Right, self intersect, or they can be more complicated singularities. And uh, so it would be more complicated. And actually, maybe it's, actually it's, not, it's not easy what happens. It's not the Coulomb branch that enters the mass product, thinking what he's done. The mass product are basically the non product of the picture. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's, that's I guess at some point. I wanted to think about if yeah, the simplest case to go to surface to higher dimension is to just like symmetric product of CFC. And um, yes, and maybe I know a few things about that. But, okay, so we'll end by a story which is supposed to apply to uh, the general case. And uh, And along the way, it involves something called uh, holomorphic stress theory, which is uh, something that you can do starting with the uh, holomorphic uh, symplectic manifold, and which is similar to what uh, you do when you have a usual, like, infinity real symplectic manifold. One way to think about usual uh, flow theory is to say you have a symplectic uh, manifold. And for example, if you have two Lagrangian sum manifolds, you can consider the infinite dimensional space of paths connecting these two Lagrangian sum manifolds. And then you can consider some kind of Morse function on this space of paths obtained by integrating the symplectic form or integrating the primitive of the symplectic form. And then you can do Morse theory, some kind of infinite dimensional Morse theory, where the critical points give you intersectional points of the Lagrangian and the gradient flow line gives you holomorphic disk. And here we can do the same thing or something similar if you're in the holomorphic uh, symplectic setting. Let's assume you have a compatible hyper structure with I, J, K. And if you have L1 and L2, two I holomorphic uh, Lagrangians, then you can consider the infinite dimensional space of paths connecting L1 and L2. And now we can cook up a function which is no longer real valued, but complex valued and actually holomorphic function W obtained essentially by integrating the holomorphic symplectic form, which is the holomorphic action functional rather than the usual real action functional in symplectic 
uh, geometry. So the claim is that if you have two holomorphic Lagrangian in a holomorphic symplectic manifold, you can uh, cook up some infinite dimensional space, which actually is naturally Keller. And on it, you can define some holomorphic function on it. And each time you have a Keller manifold with the holomorphic function on it, you can view it as some kind of Landau Ginzburg model. So you can look to the critical points of this functional, which correspond to intersection points of Lagrangian. You can count appropriate gradient flow lines connecting critical points, which would exactly produce these J theta holomorphic curves in the original Apekela geometry. And this is not the Ginsburg or Fukara Sadol story. You count also holomorphic curves with boundary on these gradient flow lines. And if you do that with this infinite dimensional space of paths, it produces solutions to something called the footer equation, which is a map from R3 to M, that is saying some appropriate, uh, some kind of generalization of the holomorphic curve equation, which now involves both complex factor I and J theta. What is W, the parameter of W? Yeah, W is just the action function. So if omega I were exact, it is D of lambda. Lambda is the holomorphic one form, and you integrate this holomorphic one form along paths. Yeah, maybe look at it's PDQ, it's the integral of PDQ. And yeah, and so in general, it's not exact, so which means to have it well defined, you need to go to some cover, it's multi valued, and that is the usual. And now, each time you have this kind of longer Gisbong model, you can cook up. Uh, various objects, if you have two intersection points, P and Q of L1 and L2, I claim you can cook up a vector space, HPQ of, let me call it 2D BPA states, because I really think to see the Lando Gisburg model as defining me some two dimensional theory, really some two dimensional sigma model with target space is space of pass, equipped with this holomorphic function W. The, the, the torus is certainly about the ground, and it was called one called like, the complex structure, right? So the torus, yes, it's homomorphic in complex structure. Sorry, just to make sure. Yes. So before you go there, so you have this uh, JT the homomorphic curves. So yes. You have a lot of the brilliant lines, or you're honest in brilliant lines. Yeah, so I claim they are honest gradient lines. So actually, it's is on the game of story to make sense of, yeah, what we really do is you have your homomorphic function W, and if you pick a phase theta, you can look to real part of W divided by exponential I theta. You get some real valued Morse function. You can compute gradient flow line for that. In the same way that in your first theory, if you compute like gradient flow line for this Morse function, you get holomorphic curves in this equation. Yes. Is that for two overlapping gradient flow line at the same channel? And yeah, it's like you have two different gradient flow lines and you count roughly, maybe it's perturbed holomorphic curves with the boundary on these two gradient yeah, flow lines. Yeah, so this thing is uh, confusing. Uh, let me see if I will get confused. So I guess in complete generality, they have a different theta. So one is to think about it. So I claim this theta, you need to interpolate between them and uh, Yes, yes. Okay, so maybe I'll forget about the higher structures. I would just remember that if I have two uh, intersection points, we should be able to attach a vector space to them. So this thing is some, some kind of upgraded version of plus three. It's not what you expect in plus three, in usual plus three. If you have two intersection points, you expect to get a number by counting things between them. And then from these numbers, you cook up a differential. And this differential attach a vector space with a pair of Lagrangians. It, it, it sounds to me like you're, um, uh, the, the, the reasoning here is supposed to be that um, you have some space and a complex valued function on it. Yes. And then something is supposed to happen which, okay, then you ignore the fact that your space is infinite dimensional, fine. Yeah. But, but what, 
what, what, why is it, I mean, it, what, what's the, what, what's the analogous thing that happens in some finite dimensional model? In some what? In, in some finite dimensional model, how do I get um, something like this? Yeah, I mean, in, in finite dimensions, it's just, uh, you have some automorphic function on the Taylor manifold. Yeah. And if you have two critical points of your function, you can uh, cook up some uh, complex made of with a generator that are going on flow lines between these two points. And with differential discounting, some perturbable holomorphic curve equation between the two gradient flow lines. Is this explained so, somewhere, this, uh, this, this finite dimensional uh, situation? Yeah, so maybe the, uh, the thing which is closer to it in, in mathematics is a paper by Idis called uh, maybe Fukaya Seidel and Gage Theory. Okay. So definitely it's, uh, it's just what physics we call space of 2D BPS states. So, so, so this story is like very closely related to the Fukaya Seidel category of W. But, but, uh, but that's what I don't understand. I mean, but, um... but, but this particular vector space is different from what you can get. For example, this thing is not some home between two objects. Sorry, I actually didn't understand. I'm sorry, I just realized now we need to tell the line. So uh, the, the critical points are just intersection points that go up to around it. Yes. And they are points. Yes, they are points. I'm, I'm, say, I'm, 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 I'm assuming that there are points. You can say assuming that transverse. I mean, I know. I'm just thinking in the usual London Ginsburg uh, story. Well, you can create the critical points for for gradient flow, yes. But that's uh, not what you want. You want to say I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah, I'm just saying I have a usual on the Gitbox story. Yeah, because it's a usual on the Gitbox on the infinite dimensional space of paths inside M. So I have an extra dimension coming from the fact that it's a space of paths. <laughs> No, I don't understand. You're a Lagrangian, but it's still finite dimensional. Yeah, that's right. But no, yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah, 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 in this picture, there is no infinite dimensional Lagrangian. I mean, you could introduce them if you want, but in the way I describe it, uh, they are not I mean, there. Like, one of the things about the Lagrangian that's probably, but then Lagrangian is open. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's correct. So what happens? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so, so you could do that, and you'll get some kind of category, like Fukaya side of category, a category of brains, which would be maybe cis category. But yeah, I'm first starting with something which actually is simpler, even if it's maybe not the standard thing. It's just saying from a two D point of view, P and Q are two vacua, okay. and I'm just looking to the space of BPS states on the real line. I mean, but somehow it alters his definition. So, the only time I describe it, there is a two dimension. Yes. And if you try to say the five dimensional, then that's from a disk or whatever tool or higher dimensional space. I wouldn't get something sweet. So, you're doing no. something. No, no, but, but it, it is from a disk to a space of pass inside M. So, you will get. So, at the end, it's something one more dimension inside M, which is finite dimension. M is finite dimension. And why do you want to do that? If my is, if my end was finite dimensional, and my is finite dimensional, why do I need to do that? Yeah, it just uh, something that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. it. Just uh, something that that you can do given some holomorphic uh, simplex uh, geometry. Yeah, and now I explain RF to the point which is I claim that there is some relation between the DT invariance of BPS spectrum of four dimensional theory. And I want to claim there is some relation with holomorphic flow theory of this integral system or Coulomb branch. So here is what I'm doing. I have my holomorphic symplectic geometry. 
finite dimensional. Inside it, I look to two finite dimensional Lagrangians, which are two very simple. One of them is a torus fiber. It's a fiber of my torus vibration. The other one is a section of my uh, family of tori. And uh, I claim uh, physically, well, generally, uh, there is always such nice section which come from the cigar boundary condition. I put my four dimensional theory on the cigar geometry. And if I reduce a circle to a point, I get a 3D theory, which is a sigma model valued in, the, in M, by definition of the 3D Coulomb branch. And uh, at the end, I should get some boundary condition coming from the tip of the cigar. And you can argue that it corresponds to some uh, section of the each vibration. Roughly one way, a simple way to understand that is that the, the yeah, so one needs to be careful if you do some mirror or not. So here I don't want, uh, yeah, I really want the kind of mirror of BCC, but not even mirror of BCC, I want mirror of O. Of the yeah, trivial. yeah, that's right. So, so yeah, I don't want BCC. And here, what I'm doing is, is really nice that the, with the torus of the integral system, I really think about having the holonomies of my 4D gauge field around the S1. And I'm just thinking if the S1 goes to a point, it means that my holonomies have to be trivial. So I just get inside the torus, I just get the point zero, which is trivial, like the trivial gauge field. So in it, if you do some, mirror or tibial, maybe you get something else, but I really want to see the one. Okay, so here's a very rough picture. And now, okay, I have these two Lagrangians which have a single intersection point. So it's a fiber and a section, a single intersection point, which uh, sounds maybe boring. But still now I want to run this holomorphic first story for these two Lagrangian L1 and L2. So I look to the infinite dimensional space of paths between L1 and L2. And I look at this holomorphic function on it. And I ask, what are the critical points? So before I say the critical points where the intersection. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It will, it will just what I would say in one moment. And it's here yeah, where well, it's, it's completely uh, natural, actually. I'm just. Uh, if I have this interval, I put L1, L2, and I take this interval very small, I get a two dimensional sigma model which target the space of paths in M with appropriate boundary conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all. So it's another way to understand this general story. If you just think upper, upper Keller thing, define you some 3D sigma model, you can just, if you put it on an interval, you get some 2D sigma model. But you need a space of paths, mm -hmm. and that's that's all. Yeah. Okay, so I want to do it for these two specific Lagrangians, and I claim in general this two-dimensional series. So there is some potential W with critical points at the intersection points of the two Lagrangians. Yeah, it looks like there is a single intersection point, but actually this W is multi-valued, essentially because my torus. As a non trivial H1 or non trivial pi 1, you can show that your thing is multi valued. And actually, so on this infinite dimensional space of path, it's not, it's not simply connected. But on some appropriate cover, infinite cover, I get another infinite dimensional space where now this W is uh, single valued. And now it has infinitely critical points which I claim are exactly in one-to-one -one correspondence with the possible uh, charges for my BPS state. And first approximation is a uh, critical point. It's just the lattice of H1 of the torus fibers. Wait, uh, but uh, you have to also lift your run of kind of double. No, but, but yeah, yeah, I no longer have, yeah, I just have double, uh, function W on something. Your 
you could shift the gradient to not only up. No, but, I, but uh, if, if the original is exactly the one in the second, can they still get one in the second? You don't have things in the second. Is that what yeah, it's also, so yeah, I don't want to consider Lagrangian inside P. One could do that, but I don't want. So I just say, I have P, I have W, and I just produce a new W, which is single value in this bigger space. And now for yeah. that, like, yes. The, the, the multivaluedness of W, I thought, um, required that, uh, that, that um, the symplectic form was not exact. So I think it's not actually. Let me think. Yeah, you. It's not a trouble. I mean, have a mult, uh, a w, multi w on the right That's not a lot of it, We tend to have a lot Yeah, I think. Well, uh, yeah, one and also one. But there are like there are other options. Yes, exactly. If I fix two Lagrangians. I get a single on the Facebook and then I throw them away. Okay, so you just add. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so let me think uh, what Vivek is saying about a non exact. Let me think uh, what. Yeah, actually, no, I'm a bit. What's happening? Okay, no, I don't think it. Okay, let me see. Okay, I can try to think more about it later. Okay. Let me just finish. So we have this issue many critical points. Even the Lagrangian L1 is not exactly Lagrangian, even if it's Omega is too exact. Yeah, yeah, maybe it is a point, right? Yeah, I think it is a point that really the thing comes from the fact that L1 has a. Yeah, as a, as a high one. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think even if omega is D of a one form, I will still have the integral of this one form around the cycle in the torus. Uh, uh, okay, but what about two, two, two exact Lagrangian? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's also, so in this case, this thing does not happen. Uh, okay. It will be it will be univalued, and I will have a single point, and that's all. Okay. So for C story, I mean, to be interesting, it's crucial that one of them is his torus, which is not exact. Uh -huh. Yeah, and now on this picture, you can view that as some kind of infinite-dimensional Landau-Gisenbrock model. And in particular, if you take two critical points, like I fix one at the reference point, which is zero, and another one, which is gamma. Then I should be able to build a vector space, which is a space of 2D BPS states of this Lando Gizmo model, which concretely is made of by counting this holomorphic curve in the original geometry, maybe corrected by these 3D instantons inside M. So it's like usual Lando Gizmo, but inside this set of paths. And then the conjecture is that you recover your space of BPS states. Uh, that way. That your space of BPS states, if you care about a specific class gamma at a specific point U, you can look to two Lagrangians, the fiber over six point and the section, and then you run this infinite dimensional Gisbox story on the space of path between these two things. And the conjecture is that it's one way to extract the space of BPS states from the Coulomb branch uh, geometry, second uh, geometry. And if one wants to, I can forget the vector spaces if you just care about numbers, like forget the 3D instances, just remember all of the curves, get a statement which is similar to the one I was talking about before. And here is a very naive physics argument, which just you start with four dimensional on a cigar. And on the end of the cigar, you want your vacuum to be U. It's a point in your Coulomb branch, it's your 4D vacuum, so you want all your field to go to the vacuum. But you impose uh, your field inside the cigar to be of charge gamma, just states of class gamma. And so, by definition, BPS states of star gamma uh, in 4D is this configuration, which 
What is it? Minimize energy. So what do you mean by like the four D picture is well, BPS? Yeah, I really think to BPS gamma is some kind of particle in the four D theory. And I think of this particle as just sitting inside near the tip of the cigar. Yeah. And then if you reduce the circle, you get this interval picture. And the gamma is 3D, it will become the sigma model which target your Coulomb branch with appropriate boundary condition on two sides. On one side, there will be the five over U, which come from saying the 4D vacuum should be used and just like all the 3D vacua compatible with this 4D condition. And on the other side, I've seen a section coming from the tip of the cigar. And in the middle, I should have things of charge gamma, which geometrically translate into some homology class condition. So this thing is a 3D description, but if I reduce it to 2D, I get this 2D sigma model value in this type of pass. And I get this rather well, Ginsburg like very description. So your gamma is labeled, well, that gamma is labeled in the tip or the, the bottom of the Yeah, I agree. Gamma is really labeling the, the interior. It's like the charge contained in this region. So actually one way to formulate this thing, and it will be my last uh, sentence, which is actually, which was actually my original motivation to think about that is there is two wall crossings. Three, one is a two dimensional Chekhoti Varpa story, which will apply typically if you have some London Ginsburg potential. On the other hand, you have this 40 and equal two story of Francis Soberman wall crossing. And you can ask, can you reduce one to the other? So obviously formally, it looks different, so for example, Chekhoti Vafa with the simplest case of Chekhoti Vafa, the London Ginsburg potential has finitely many critical points. So you get some identity involving GLN or something. Whereas in Quantivis Schlomberman, it seems to involve like algebra vector fields on the torus. So definitely they both fit into a common algebraic structure, but the question is, is it true one is really a special case of the other in some appropriate sense? So in one way to answer this question is that if I start with the 40 n equal two theory, can I cook up some n equal to 2, 2, 2D theory, such that the 4D BPS becomes the 2D BPS. And yet the proposal is that this 2D theory is this London Ginsburg model with this infinite dimensional target space of pass to the Coulomb branch. So actually I would like something better. I would like a finite dimensional London Ginsburg model ultimately. But here is an answer that there is an infinite dimensional uh, space and somehow it's not a contradiction with the fact that simple Chekhov does not look like Confucian because they are actually infinitely critical points. So actually, it's not the kind of small standard Chekhov where it will be finite critical points, but it's some kind of advanced one. Matt, it's like the he said it obviously recovers, but I don't see how. Uh, sorry, which one? Uh, well, the, 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 the case is like Cormac actually. Uh huh, yes. So we understand why, why we're having this test. Yeah, that's what I'm explaining is some kind of different explanation. It's not. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah I, I don't know a simple way to compare them. So they should be somehow compatible, but I don't know like how to go from one to the other in a simple. Simple way. So, so explain then the, the so you you want to say that the actual phase of of BPS phase is a smaller difference of some of those differentials. Yeah, that's right. Of some complex where the objects have some uh, kind of holomorphic curves. And some differential involving some maybe 3D instantons. So maybe something a bit confusing is that in the previous story, I only talk about holomorphic curves. I, I did not talk about complexes or differential or vector spaces. So here, if you forget the instanton corrections, it just gradient lines in the on the Gisborne model, which are holomorphic curves in the integral system. And it is what I was talking about before, just holomorphic curves. Right, right, right. Now. 
So it's about to go back from the super class and then to the complement. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in general, I mean, not really. I mean, uh, uh, okay. I mean, I, I know. I mean, yeah, it's one way to produce some kind of two D series, but not every two D series will come from from uh, such very complicated four D uh, construction. Can you maybe explain how for um, it's somehow it's not obvious which where we uh, which where we the primary cross gamma that are looking at that flow, for example, you think about flash that flow. Um, you, you, I mean, you, yes. you're telling the flash flow, right? Yes. Is that obvious? Uh, you say it is obvious. Not. Flash obvious? I don't know if it's obvious. I'm saying there is some. Well, you have written down the three D right? So just by forgetting two out of the, the three directions, you get a flow equation with the plane. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, it has something to do with the problem. Why? I know. So, 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 I mean, so, 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 yeah, there is some other thing. Like on one side, gamma, I mean, gamma is a geometric, I mean, this charge light is the geometric meaning. It's really the, I mean, the first approximation is the first homology of the torus fiber. And so it's exactly the, it happens to be exactly the fundamental group of the space of paths. So I mean, I'm saying like geometry in 40 to have a thick given, given electromagnetic charge gamma. From a 3D picture, it means that it's the corresponding pass as a given homology pass. The entire torus is But the entire torus is I mean, the torus does not shrink. I mean, the torus is there, but I impose my Gamma to go to a specific point in the sciences torus. Ah, so, 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 so. Yes, you say the brain has. You just use some other integral to put together. Don't yes. Really... Yeah, that's oh, all. No, you know, you have to do one to one thing because you have an ordinal theory of the disk. Yes. Which in some limit reduces to. <laughs> That's yes, that's mostly we do want to have some omega background. Ah, so here I think it's very really important. I don't want the omega background. Okay. Yeah, it's very important. So definitely people have considered this geometry in many different contexts with the omega background. And I don't want the omega background. If you get the omega background, you cannot get this picture so because okay. yeah, you get various stories that I don't know. Yeah, so so so, 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 so yeah, the point is that if you turn on the omega background epsilon, then, for example, the torus fiber will no longer be an okay boundary condition for the omega background. And actually, it's something very interesting that I do not fully understand, but I understand partly, which is like, so this story should be the limit, some limit epsilon equal to zero from some half omega background story. Yes, and, and definitely there are pictures where, where you, people turn the omega background, half omega, like omega background on the cigar. But then, yeah, they, they cannot put the, something like a torus fiber because it's wrong, it's a wrong complex structure. But they can put some, and in general, you need to make some choice for what kind of boundary condition you want there. And for example, like for class S series, there is, like if you pick a basis of homology on your curves, then for example, you can ask, I don't remember the exactly condition. Like you have some kind of function Nielsen coordinates, and you can ask half, half of them to be zero, maybe. It's one way to hook up a nice Lagrangian into M, which, which is Lagrangian for the correct complex structure compatible with the half omega background. And I think it has been checked. I guess there is some cryptic remark in some paper by Jörg Teschner that if you take epsilon goes to zero, actually this kind of brain becomes a, the torus fiber. Which is a very non-trivial limit. Usually, what people do when they take the omega background 
that is section x. So if I want to have epsilon equal to zero, then take another grain L epsilon. And usually the L epsilon looks like that. So actually you get a single series. And, and you know, this thing is usually the whatever, the maybe in the Kravov Shatashvili story where you you quantize some system and the and the various yeah, right. yeah and these things are like the state or something. Yeah. But what I want is some kind of epsilon goes to zero limit of this picture. And the claim, yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> a, the, the claim is that it's extremely singular, and in particular, it depends on the next right choice of the point Q. And in these limits, is epsilon somehow I don't know it becomes maybe closer and closer to vertical, and the limit actually becomes a fiber over some point Q. And and this infinite collection of critical points somehow becomes this other collect infinite collection of critical points. So definitely, I don't. Okay, I, I don't. I don't understand the full details of that. But yeah, it's crucial in this theory. I don't take an omega background on the cigar. It's some kind of singular limit of what you get by putting some uh, sure. omega background. Yeah, yeah it's some section. And um, this would be something like uh, it's uh, some precondition defined by the position. Yeah, that's what defined by the tip of the cigar. So the claim is that the the cigar is something happening in the four-dimensional theory. Mm -hmm. But then if you put the circle goes to zero size, you get the interval. But somehow there is a corresponding boundary condition at this end of the interval. Which is a 3D version of the fact that the circle closes in the cigar geometry. Mm -hmm. So the path you pass through 3D, you can see the S. Yeah, that's right. Before the S, you don't see it. So in 3D, you have to have a boundary condition the back of the Yeah. Okay. I still want to understand. So you have the 3D equation, right? The command directionality gives you the gives you in. So if you yes. throw away the command direction, you get a two dimensional equation. Yes. If you want to say that the solution of the two dimensional equation are labeled by the same data form of the curve. Yes. Is that obvious? Is that a home of the curve equation? Yes, yes, yes. That, 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 this equation, this 2D equation. If you, if, you, if you forget one of the terms, it's a holomorphic curve equation. So this thing is a perturbation of the. Yes, exactly. It's a holomorphic curve equation. Yeah, actually, the thing I want to forget is S. this term, yes. To recover the J theta. Um, but, yeah, so now then you understand, yeah, you say, um, I forget that almost curve. Wait, wait, uh, no, what I need one more thing is, at each section of, yeah, maybe there is I something. I understand why with the dimensional logic is the model itself. So, yeah. We recovered a moment of curve, and that's why, you know, I mean, yeah. it's it sounds like it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but the intersection of L and S is not our uh, the same. That is, uh, yeah, so, so maybe the, yeah. I, I put too many boundaries. Okay, so maybe there is, ah, okay, yeah, so there is something yeah, that I didn't have to explain, sorry. That, okay, I have a space of curve like that. And some more, yeah, that's all. Maybe the confusing thing is that I claim that at the end it's reduced to holomorphic curve with boundary on L, yeah. not on L and S. Is it the yeah. confusion? Yeah. 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 So the point will be that actually this holomorphic curve with boundary on L and S can be rewritten as something with only boundary on L. And it's related to the fact that S is actually topologically trivial because it's just a section of the base, it's just on. Uh, fun space. So actually, there is a picture. Okay, here is a picture that I draw somewhere. 
Yeah, so so I claim that okay, the so solution of this gradient flow equation is some kind of one parameter family of paths. And uh, let me see. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so definitely at some point there's some kind of non trivial topology. It's kind of one parameter family of paths and reorganize themselves to form just a disk. And there is something not not uh, in particular, you, you, you do have, yeah. I think, yeah, I guess, I think it, it just like it just, yeah. well, it's not, if you, you, you don't have much, but if you somehow want to map all you, you want to pick a funny boundary condition where all of s gets met, usually, right? If you in the uh, that R2, yeah, it's a dip, it should be there. I mean, in your picture, the R2 is actually a script. Yes. But I think what you want to do is you want to map, uh, instead of like mapping half of, so, so that script is bihomorphic to, uh, to, uh, to a disk. Yes, exactly, with two but things. But I think what you want to do is that you want to string. Yes, exactly, exactly. So then you're back to curves of tracks. So that does make sense. Yes, I think. So you have to explain why does that string go point. It, it, it's got a curve your constant that the S has to string because you want curves where instead of like half the boundary mapping to S, the half the boundary maps to a point. Yes. So why is that? And then you're done. It looks great. Yes, yes. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, the holomorphic curve equation level I would have to think, but I can topologically is because S is like topologically true. There is no, no I don't think you can say that. There's yeah. a lot of I don't think that that, that makes sense. We will People who flirt here with non-helpful run this all the time. So some reason yeah. you're mapping the section of the boundary to a point. And you're probably want to map it um the point. It could be that you have I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Think the fact that it's topologically, I know you can look at some like what is a projection to S, you just get some loop, but it bounded this, so you can your holomorphic curve equation will always, exactly. yes, yes. So, so I think you would, I would just follow on with the physics that would probably tell you somehow. Yeah, yeah, funny matrix, yeah. Not your just... yeah, that's why. So, so definitely, yeah, the, I, I, I agree there is something. To prove that that if you consider this strip that is reduced to this disk, I agree that I claim that, but I agree pray there is some proper holomorphic curve argument that I have not. And you also know, and say that the, the, the previous count is actually um, you have to classify this reading. Yeah, that's small than that. Okay, you're almost very good record on the back. Yeah. <laughs> I actually I have I I have I have one I have one last question. <laughs> yeah, so, so um this business you do of taking these two points and then studying this vector space or whatever, uh does, yes. does, it, does that get around the analytical difficulties of thinking about future equation? Or do you still have to think about future equation? No, no, I don't think it gets rid of the analytic difficulties. Yeah, so, so, so how, how do you see those still? Uh how do you see what like the the analytic difficulties? You mean the? I I I mean uh, you know you know like um, uh, this kind of analytical difficulties is about when you study the compactification of this space and its boundaries and so on. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and 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 what kind of breakings can you? I mean, and if you're not considering this whole two categorical structure, you'd expect to see less of these breakings. Yeah, yeah, that, that's why. So, so, yeah, that's why. If you, yeah, you were saying if I only care about these kind of two D space, yeah, like the space attached to pair of critical points, is it simpler than to look at the full categorical structure? But for the top, yeah. the first half of the top, you just want to take the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's why. That's why. So you could forget about that. 
then I can go to something else. You might want to study to be one of my bar products. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so I guess the short answer is that I don't really know. Ah, okay. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, just a crazy question. Is there any gas for, okay, so, so now I understand what people are doing, counting TPI, uh, like they're counting all the characteristics of some chain complex, and we don't know how to compute the differential because we don't know how to solve the filter equation. Is that right? That's the. Uh, for people that are on the view, you just uh, uh, yes, maybe, yes. Uh, yes, 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 yes. And uh, do we know the gas? Can we get the answer? What the after you put in different what the chain contact should be described? Yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah, I think I don't know that either. So, yeah, indeed, like what is the simplest non trivial example where. This is an equation should really matter. I'm not sure. It may not also have it. It may not be it. Yes. Um, so definitely it's related to this uh, categorified conservative sum amount formula. So there is some some paper by um, Hassan Khan and like more. I think the claim that to have a categorified, I think even for Checo di Vafa to get some kind of categorified version of the wall crossing formula, you need to have some natural differential. But uh, yeah, I've not, uh, yeah, it's like some obvious question that I don't know the answer to either. Okay, thank you. I've not understand all the secrets.